to a finance and then you chief finance officer. And this 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 gets out or hits the operating services or outside the unit requirement. And a lot of times uh, it's difficult to get this past the chief finance officer because your finance people are going to look at it and, and they might think that the pain program is going to be like every other program and therefore uh, are surprised to find out that sometimes uh, financials and developing financial support to support pain program is a little difficult than they thought. So they're going to have to, the, the CEO has to help the finance team um, uh, understand that funds are going to have to come from operating revenue from essentially somebody else's area. So with finance, uh, you have to develop the pro forma budget of all the potential sources along with a pro forma revenue and expense projection uh, and the medical leader has to be present in all of these discussions and directly involved with them throughout. Otherwise, you don't, from an administrative perspective, you don't have the foggiest idea if you're about projections or anything close to realistic. So that's, that's critical. And I can't stress that enough. Your medical leader has to be present and involved in all those discussions from the very beginning. The other thing that you have to do is, and this is very important, develop a charge master for the service, and you have to get finance to complete the pro forma based upon the current payer contracts already in place. So what, what do I, especially in Medicaid, because children's hospitals uh, um, have the Medicaid market locked up, whether we want to or not, uh, we do. And so what do I mean by this? Well, it's important when you're getting your program established to make sure that your financing contracting experts that you have on staff have looked at all of your payer contracts to find out what you can and cannot charge for. Now, if we're doing this, and we should do this because it's the right thing to do, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on, but the truth of the matter is um, you're really not fulfilling your fiduciary responsibility if you don't um, have the charge master update to include these services. Um, and it's difficult to defend not doing that, even though that's something that uh, sometimes many of us find is tasteful. But this will hit or get at the operational sources from services delivery uh, because you ought to be able to charge for the services um, as you um, as you carry them out, there's nothing wrong with that as long as you do a good job uh, on behalf of the children and their, and their families. So, <clears throat> begin building the support base uh, with your foundation and your uh, philanthropic staff early on. And, um, for example, is there a grateful family who may be interested? That was a huge issue for us here in our program. We found a family who was very, very interested in supporting this. Uh, is there someone on any of your boards for whom this, this initiative might resonate? Are corporate sponsorships an option? Uh, sometimes that's a, an opportunity. Uh, also, is there a professional athletic team who would be willing to take on sponsorship? We have, uh, here in the Twin Cities, we have professional athletic teams in all of the major sports. They hardly ever win, so we thought we might be able to get them interested in, uh, you know, supporting the pain program and nothing else. And, uh, that, that's, uh, you know, the Vikings have been snatching defeat from the jaws of victory for, I don't know, many years now. But that's always a possible option in pain programs and uh, uh, palliative care and other areas like this are, are right for support from such organizations. <laughs> And the only thing I would ask is to keep in mind, development takes time, that's why it's called development. You get, you bring the head of your foundation and get them working two or three years ahead of time so that by the time you need the funds for capital investment, uh, they have lined up some gifts, sometimes it takes longer than that. But those are things, all of these areas, I would encourage you uh, to keep in mind and start working early on. And you need to make the pain program a specified part of the strategic planning process because it builds legitimacy and definition and entails budget legitimacy. Now, what, what do I mean by that? Well, 
A lot of people, um, you know, I've worked with physicians over the years, and many of them have told me, well, this strategic planning thing, that, that's just a bunch of baloney. It never leads to anything. You guys sit around talking constantly about how many angels can, uh, uh, you know, stand on, dance on the head of a pen, and it never turns into anything. The, the thing about a strategic plan is that to your boards, when you go to get money, the plan legitimizes or lays the predicate for what you're trying to do. If you've never said anything to any of your boards about this, and there's nothing in your plan about it, and then you go in and you say, I need $3.5 billion to build out a pain program on the fifth floor, people will look at you like you just popped your last cap, because where did, where did this come from? This, wasn't been, this hasn't been discussed, this wasn't talked about, um, so that's what I mean when I say start early and make it part of your uh, planning process and build it into your strategic plan. Again, two to three years before you plan to turn the lights on. And to those ends, talk about it early and often with all your relevant boards, governance and foundation in particular. Now, I said earlier about the importance of, I talked earlier about the importance of removing barriers. You wouldn't think that this might be an issue, but it is. Because you ask certain members, and we've seen this here, members of the medical staff um, uh, will, will, um, will object because an excellent program means, at least in part, that you're not going to be doing things the way we've always done them. And you will have individuals who will uh, step up and say, I don't want to do this because um, it creates a problem, this is not what I learned, uh, there are all kinds of reasons. Uh, so you're going to have to learn how to deal with them. Now, the important thing to remember on that is that most people are not bad. Nobody wants children to be in pain. Uh, they want to do the right thing. And sometimes we say, well, people fear change. I don't know so much that uh, what I've seen on our pain, palliative care, and integrative medicine program that people fear the change. What I really think is sometimes they fear loss. They, you know, loss of control. Now they tell me I have to use this cream before I start an IV. Loss of faith. Hey, this is my clinic. Now you're telling me what to do. We have another, what I call CCD. A corporate cram down. I got a memo from the CEO, and now we have to do this. Uh, it takes much longer. Um, it doesn't take any longer my clinic. Time is money. It's going to cause financial uh, manifestations for us. <coughs> As we'll see, and we measured this, with the comfort of promise, uh, in many cases, when properly implemented, it doesn't take more time. It actually lowers procedure time. You know, you spend a little bit of time up front and it makes things simpler uh, at, at the end. So, you know, we go about our daily work and we commonly utilize measurements and data. Clinicians utilize measurements and data all the time. Uh, it, you, you, your work is predicated on that. In the C-suite, in the CEO's office, we utilize measurements all the time. You know, what's our work hours per patient day? What are, what's our current ratio and our acid test ratio? And, and so on and so forth. The problem is when you're implementing something like pain program, these technical products will not be all that helpful because we have to address that fear of loss before we're able to move ahead in a, in a more unfettered way. But we need to keep in mind, I think, it's important for management to remember, if you take care of the intangibles, the tangibles tend to take care of themselves. You know, if, if you, in that, you know, it's fear of loss uh, is an intangible, but if you take care of and you address that fear of loss up front, sometimes the other tangibles, such as time and money, uh, will, will, will get in line, will take care of themselves. So one of the things that we found is very important, I think, is, is to make sure that your medical administration is politically on board. You almost have to treat this when you're implementing the program like a political process, because it is. 
which means you have to have your medical or professional executive committee uh, uh, on board. So it needs to be discussed uh, ahead of time in a couple of years uh, there to get their support. Um, that's going to depend upon, obviously, uh, in our case, Stefan Fiedry Store, but either whoever's running the program in your individual facilities, uh, they're going to have to be prepared to go there and present and talk about what, what what's going on. You need to have the chief medical officer on board, the chief of staff, if, uh, and every hospital is a little bit different, uh, so not everyone has all these individuals, but chief of staff often is an elected uh, position. That has to be involved, that person has to be involved. The chairman of the pediatrics, the chief scientific or academic officer, if you have them, the in chiefs, the surgeon in chief, physician, pediatrician in chief, because all of these people, when you have them lined up with you on this, they'll come in really handy when the chips are down. And think in advance of how you're going to handle those members of the staff who choose not to comply with the major principles and initiatives of the program. And it will happen. Uh, it doesn't, it's very usual. It'll have to go away. So why should the CEO or other leaders get and stay out of the way, and why should they support this at all? Well, principally because it's the right thing to do. And this isn't rocket science. And our pain in pilot care and integrative medicine program is the right thing to do. And someday payers will see this, even though they don't get it right now. And we may have to help them see the light. We just finished here a very, very contentious renegotiation of a contract with one of our major payers, our largest payer. And it was nasty. And we actually ended up going out of network for a couple of days, only two and a half days. But we were running ads in the paper, and they were running ads in the paper, and we were accused by them of not being interested in doing anything to help uh, control the costs of health care. Now, that really was frustrating. And the reason it was frustrating was because nothing further, nothing could be further from the truth. What does the pain program have to do with it? What does the palliative care program have to do with that? Well, it's, it's really simple. Uh, every time um, the pain team helps a child die at home, comfortably surrounded by loved ones, in an environment that's, that is better for them than being in here in the hospital, they've done the right Thing for the child and for the family. And the other benefit is they just saved the insurance company tens of thousands of dollars. Same thing with the palliative care team. Every time they help uh, the family of a trisomy 18 baby make a determination not to have open heart surgery, they have just saved the insurance company, a half a million dollars. But we get no credit for that. None whatsoever. And that's not fair. So at the end of this month, I'm having dinner with the CEO of that same great big insurance company who less than a month ago was accusing us of not being interested in doing anything about the cost of health care. And I'm going to explain that not only are we interested in that, more importantly, we're interested in doing the right thing for the children and the families. And this is something that is incredibly important because um, things are going to get tougher for us in healthcare. And we'll talk a little bit, uh, a little bit later on about Medicaid and some other uh, uh, issues going on in Washington D.C. Now you see, we have a little bean counter down here in the uh, lower right-hand corner. That's actually a picture of our current CFO. Not really, but uh, <laughs> the picture. But for the bean counter amongst us, um, there are indirect but significant financial benefits for our program, and the same should be the case for every such program. <coughs> Excuse me. Staff turnover may go down. Staff turnover in one of our units decreased by over 60% after we implemented the comfort promise. We are doing more measurement uh, on that, and uh, we'll come out a little bit later on. Uh, hopefully, we will get that published. But uh, we do believe that that is an important uh, consideration. And one of the pushbacks that you'll get from, and we got from the medical staff, is that well, when you implement the comfort promise, 
procedure time will increase. In our case, procedure time decreased from 20 minutes down to 16 minutes because when you properly control pain up front, then you don't have to deal with some other things uh, uh, in, in procedure. Also, we saw our patient satisfaction scores increase. In Minnesota, ours went up a little over 10%, and we're watching that constantly. Now, better pain control for kids might decrease nursing kind of turnover, although this still needs to be studied. We already know this. We know that 30 to 50% of all new RNs elect either to change positions or leave nursing completely within the first three years of their clinical practice. And according to the National Healthcare RN Retention Report from 2014, the cost of turnover for a bedside nurse is between 44 and 63,000. <coughs> Some of the nursing journals even put it as that cost as high as 80,000 in the case of critical care nursing. Therefore, it would seem that reducing turnover and improving the overall job satisfaction and performance are both important in making sure that patients and family satisfaction uh, remain high while promoting their quality of care. Now, the other thing we notice is this is the smart thing to do because there's definitely a market differentiation factor for effective, effective uh, pain control. Uh, other primarily law hospitals tend not to do as well uh, uh, as well, I guess, as we uh, do in kids. As a matter of fact, there's an organization here in uh, Minnesota called ICSI, the Institute for Clinical Systems Improvement. It is a, a, a group of all of the hospital and system CEOs and the major insurance company CEOs here in the Twin Cities. And one of the things that we're looking at is uh, trying to locally get our arms around the opioid epidemic. We got pulled out, we got singled out by the ICSI team because of our reputation uh, in how we handle pain and pain. And they have actually asked for people here to serve on that team to advise all the other hospitals in appropriate pain management, pain control, um, as one piece of a multi-part uh, um, opioid um, initiative. So we have become the go-to source for pediatric pain management, especially during the crisis. The war gets around the greater community, and Children's Hospital may feel the market share boost because of it. Uh, there will be a philanthropic impact that is very positive. Um, um, you can also see a decreased 30-day readmission rate, which we did. We're watching that constantly. In fact, that's one of our major indicators that we share with our board of directors. Uh, every board meeting, 30-day readmission rate, and there can be significant cost savings in chronic pain patients and palliative care. So, <clears throat> the important thing to keep in mind from, from the CEO's perspective is, as we go into the world that we're heading now, and more risk will be placed upon the those of us who are providing uh, care, the provider system, every time the pain management team and the palliative care team helps a, a patient remain out of the hospital or to die comfortably at home, we're improving the patient family experience. But like I said before, we're usually saving the insurance company money, which is fine, but we're doing this for the kids and their families. There's nothing wrong with saving money so long as it improves the quality of life for that child and that family at that same time. You're not saving money for the sake of saving money. And this is often overlooked because when you're implementing a pain management program, and I include palliative care there as well, you will get a lot of pushback uh, because on the surface of it, it'll look like it's costing a lot of money. And I would urge everyone, when you hear that, to make sure you lift up the people who are making that charge to keep in mind, there are a lot of ways to deliver value other than doing things cheaply. And that is a pet peeve of mine, and I often get into it with finance people uh, over that. You have to look at the total value, not just what you're spending on the program. We all do a lot of things in our hospitals that we lose money on, on the surface. 
for example, here, uh, you know, if we were interested only in making money uh, at a contribution margin for everything we do, we wouldn't have a level one trauma center either. But we're not about to give that up because it's the right thing to do, and it has other positive benefits. And the same thing can be said about the pain program, that people prefer to look the other way and be short-sighted. We have to do the right thing. I'm reminded that Harry Truman had a lot of uh, great sayings, but he, he said that the, basically what he said was when he was president, he spent an awful lot of time trying to work hard to convince people to do things that they should want to do and are supposed to do anyway. And that's the way I look at our paper. We're trying to convince people to do things that they ought to want to do in the first place. Um, and there are ways that you can convince them um, that in a way that will make sense to them. Remember, if you take care of the um, intangibles, the tangibles will tend to work themselves out. Now, so one might not think this, but a premier pain program takes funding and courage uh, because you have to demand that people do the right thing. You have to require uh, that uh, <coughs> the people are forthcoming and when you are uh, going through arguments in the medical executive committee, your 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 fallback position always is keep kids in the center of everything. What's the right thing for kids? And if you do that, uh, I think you'll end up uh, in good shape. 